In yesterday's episode, we explored a crack in the divide, only to accidentally blow up a skyscraper blocking off the other side of it. To move around, we had to go into a cave, the Cave of Abaddon. In the back of the cave, we found a building, and when we climbed to the rooftop on the other side of the ruined skyscraper, Ulysses appeared and took Eddie. He then revealed that Eddie had additional nuclear launch codes. All this time, he's been using us to transport Eddie from the Hopeville Missile Silo to his home in the heart of the Divide. We now have to climb down from this rooftop and travel across the final part of this crack in the Divide to track down Eddie and finally confront Ulysses. At the bottom of the stairs of this ruined building, we see a ramp leading off to the southeast and a hole in the wall to the northeast. Next to this hole, we see one of Ulysses' blue item of interest marks, so we'll head through the wall to explore there first. Here we find a first aid box and two Nuka-Cola machines filled with Nuka-Cola. When done, we can head down the ramp to the east, made from fallen scaffolding. This leads to another broken floor of this building, and from here, we can drop down to the ground, which connects to the broken basement of this building. In the basement, we find a military shipping crate, and after looting, we can move east out into the open. Nearby, we see some ruined boxes, shipping containers maybe, and then a big puddle of blood near to a delivery truck. In the back of the truck, we find a dead marked man. Underneath the truck, we find skeletons, one of which is clutching a duffel bag filled with all sorts of goodies. Inside, we find a brush gun, some ammunition, and a holotape. Mission Report Looting this mission report completes one of the ten steps to achieving the challenge, Nostalgia. Find all journal entries in the Divide. Initial recon of the Divide has met with heavy resistance. These ghouls... The troopers have started calling them marked men, are smarter than the typical ferals we're used to. Yesterday, we found some old pre-war cages they've used to capture death claws. God knows what they were planning to do with them, but one of the things must have escaped, judging from the carnage. I've ordered double watches until we find it. So those weren't shipping containers, those were cages. Cages the marked men were using to capture death claws. But the cages are empty. No death claws to be seen, only corpses. I wonder if the death claws are still loose in this part of the divide. We find two boxes in one of the cages, filled with ammunition. We see another blue truck next to a ruined overpass off to the southeast, but we also see red marks on our compass. Enemies nearby, crouching down. We can climb upon one of the ruined support pillars of the overpass and creep forward. We see movement in the back of the truck through one of the cracks. They couldn't reach me on this pillar, so they both ran off. Climbing this support pillar, we can look off towards a little pool, where we see a bunch of water gushing into it out of a pipe. We find them trying to hide behind the waterfall. When dead, we can crawl into the back of the truck where we find three military shipping crates. Heading out, we can go towards that pool to explore it. At the bottom of the pool, we find a sack filled with perishable food, and behind the pipe, gushing out water, we see one of Ulysses' red warning marks painted on some wood. Next to it is a path leading into a cave. Heading into the cave, we see one of those miniature nuclear warheads sticking out of the rock. On the ground to the right, we see a bunch of scattered goods, including a bloody duffel bag. In the duffel bag, we find ammo and the NCR radio distress beacon. Mayday! 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 This is NCR Trooper Gleason calling anyone listening on this channel. My platoon has been wiped out, and I am pinned down by a goddamn huge death claw in a place called the Divide. So far, I've been able to scare it away with flares, but I lack any explosives to kill the damn thing. Please assist. I say again, please assist. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is NCR Trooper Gleason calling anyone listening on this channel. Looks like one of those escaped death claws may be in this cave. 
Gleason was never rescued. We find her skeleton lying atop a puddle of her own blood. As we creep forward, the cave entrance collapses behind us, revealing yet another miniature nuclear warhead. We're now trapped in a cave with a death claw, and peering around a corner to the south, we see him. Thankfully, his back is turned, so we can get off a sneak critical. Oh, almost caught him. These one-hit kills are murder. But wait a minute, didn't Gleason say something about a flare gun? Oh yeah, they scare off abominations, and death claws count as an abomination. Well, let's try it again. Even though I caught myself on fire in the process, I at least got this Deathclaw. And he's a special Deathclaw, named Rar. On his corpse, we find Rar's Talon. Upon looting it, we get a message. This claw is larger and more impressive than those of lesser Deathclaws. You might be able to turn it into a weapon if you find a workbench. We can take this to any workbench to craft the Fist of Rar. It doesn't require any other ingredients, but it does require an unarmed skill of 75 to craft the thing. As a side note, if we have the Wild Wasteland trait, this weapon is instead called Fist of the North Rar, which, which of course is a reference to the post-apocalyptic anime Fist of the North Star. The Fist of Rar is much more powerful than your typical Deathclaw gauntlet. It has a damage of 50, while a typical gauntlet has only 20. This brings its DPS up to 97.8, compared to a typical gauntlet's 32.6. It has higher critical damage at 75, although it has a lower critical percent multiplier of only 2, compared to the standard gauntlet's 5. But it's much faster, dealing 2 attacks per second, compared to the standard gauntlet's 1.6 attacks per second. This is due to it costing fewer AP, only 24 compared to a standard gauntlet's 26. With Rar dead, we find a suitcase amongst skeletons to the southeast, possibly some of Rar's past meals, but there's not much else here, so we can take out our laser detonator and get rid of the miniature nuclear warhead to the southeast. This sadly doesn't reveal anything new. So, turning around, we can detonate the one that's blocking our way out. And with that, we can leave Rar's cave. Swimming across the lake, we find a duffel bag on the opposite side of the pipe. On the opposite side of the lake, we see another miniature nuclear warhead off to the northwest, and the faces of marked men, standing in the windows of a nearby collapsed building. reasons these were so hard to kill is because, as ghouls, they regenerate health the closer they are to a source of radiation. So since they were standing above one of those warheads, their health was regenerating after each hit, which means that choosing weapons with slow reload time can be the difference between making progress or finding them fully healed. Once we're satisfied they're all dead, we can creep forward. And you know what I hate most about satchel charges? They blend in too dang well with the ground. <laughs> I, st I replayed this footage and I still couldn't see it. After consuming yet another doctor bag to repair our crippled limb, we can scale the side of a ruined building to get a better look at our surroundings. We see a ruined building off to the north, and it's connected via scaffolding to the ruined building to the west, where we just killed those marked men. Before we head towards the building, we can take out our laser detonator and get rid of the miniature warhead next to the building. 
That comes in handy. The blast knocked down the corpses of the marked men I killed from the building, making them easier to loot. Detonating the warhead revealed a passage beneath the building. Underneath, we can loot a few containers until we walk out the other side. We find two ammo containers next to a garbage bin to the northwest, and we get attacked by a plasma blast. What? Someone sees us, but from where? Oh, there he is. I don't like being on the ground here. I feel like I'm in a fishbowl. Seeking better cover, we can climb up some scaffolding and through a window of the ruined building. This brings us to a wrecked hallway. We can cross through it to the other side where we find another scaffolding ramp going up even higher or we can take it down to a small camp. Here we can rest on some mattresses. And in the duffel bag to the east, we find some ammunition and the NCR Ranger action report. Third platoon, Cazador Company. 4th Ranger Battalion Action Report, Staff Sergeant Balmoral reporting. We've reached the area local tribes call the Divide, but so far, I don't think this will be a suitable route for bringing troops to Hoover Dam. The terrain is a nightmare. We've seen evidence of hostile indigenous life, and the Geiger counters are ticking like grandfather clocks on turbo. Full report when the advanced scouts come back at 2300 hours, but as of now, I'm recommending we abandon this mission. Nearby, we can loot a metal box, a footlocker, and an ammo crate, and then we find another duffel bag to the southwest. Inside, we find ammunition, chems, and the NCR Ranger Action Report Addendum. 3rd Platoon, Cazador Company, 4th Ranger Battalion Action Report Addendum. Staff Sergeant Balmoral reporting again. Looks like we aren't the only ones that had the idea to check this place out. Our advanced scouts encountered heavy legion activity in the area. The troopers are gearing up to hit them tonight hopefully before they know we're here. I don't think they ever got the chance to hit the Legion. After all, it's likely that the marked men we just killed were the very NCR troops who struck this camp. But then, according to this report, that means we should expect to find more marked men. Marked men sporting Legion gear. Heading up the scaffolding, we can turn west to crawl into a broken room. At the end, we find a terminal sticking out of the rubble, inexplicably still powered on. This is Jackie's computer. Here we find three entries. The first one, noise. Swear to God, if I lose one more night of sleep over these noises, I'm going to strangle somebody. Knocking pipes my butt. Do these slumlords think it's easy running the safety protocols for an entire ICBM launch complex on two hours of sleep? It's a doggone miracle nobody started World War III over a low-flying titmouse. And yes, I am having to censor this in order to appease the YouTube advertising gods, but I'm sure they're going to be fine with the word titmouse. In the next one, earthquakes. Fantastic. Now there's earthquakes. Earthquakes! Sure, Commander Devlin says they're minor ones and nothing to worry about, but come on. Earthquakes! Did no one think to check fault lines before they built a massive underground missile complex? Your tax dollars at work, folks. Swear to God. When my term's up, I'm moving to Canada. Oh, this poor guy. And in the final one, more earthquakes. Minor and nothing to worry about. If that last quake wasn't a 5.0 at the least, I'm Dean Domino. Oh, nice tie-in with dead money there. That's it. I'm requesting a transfer before the whole plow... <laughs> We learned that earthquakes are not conducive to writing journal entries. But this raises an interesting question. We know that the military was keeping nuclear warheads underground, but surely they weren't detonating them beneath a military base and civilian town. But then again, we do know that even in the real world, most nuclear detonation tests are done underground to limit fallout in the atmosphere. Could that have been going on here? Or were these earthquakes caused by the weather experiments that the Big Empty was doing here at the Divide? At any rate, outside the terminal, we can move to the window to the west, where we find two ammo crates on the ground. And from here, we can take the opportunity to peer out the window to see if we can spy any more hostels. And sure enough, off to the southwest, on a ledge directly above another nuclear warhead, we find a sniper. I don't want to have anyone else sniping at me in that fishbowl. When done, we can head out, back down the ramp, turn west into the hallway, and back to the catwalk. Looking around, I think I got all of the snipers. We can crouch down to see if we're discovered. Oh, danger. 
From where? Ah! A marked man wearing a stealth boy named Blade attacks from nowhere. I almost had him. I completely bungled that. I wasn't paying attention to my health. Reloading a previous save, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my riot shotgun. Standing in the same spot, we wait, but Blade never returns. Where did he go? Well, I'm not gonna wait around for him forever, so heading down the ramp, we can creep past another lake and another flowing tube to find a path to the northwest under a fallen scaffolding bridge. This leads us to a small path between the rocks, filled with a little bit of water, and lined with more satchel charges. Here we find the Waste Disposal Station. Heading to the northeast, we find a duffel bag, and on the wall, we find the next Ralphie poster. But before we enter the station, I thought I heard something behind me. Creeping round... Ah! But wait, that doesn't look like Blade. It was two of them, and one was using a stealth boy, but neither of them are Blade. Where did these guys come from? Where's Blade? Well, he still hasn't seen me. Not sure when we'll find him again. So turning around, we can pass one of Ulysses' blue graffiti marks to enter the Waste Disposal Station. Inside, we find ourselves in a cave. Creeping forward, we see some light to the north. And as we get closer, oh, we see barrels and barrels of toxic nuclear waste. Looking up, we see the station, and this hole is lined with more of these barrels. This pre-war government entity was disposing of their nuclear waste by dumping it into this hole. Could all of this nuclear waste be somehow responsible for the tunnelers? We see human skeletons draped over many of these barrels. We find one lead-lined metal box, a copy of Wasteland Survival Guide, on the ground behind one of the barrels with a skeleton splayed over it, and a first aid kit in this pile, but we don't see any way to climb up. So turning around, we can continue along the path to the east. Eventually, we see a little nook to the right, lit with daylight where we find more toxic barrels, and here, another lead-lined metal box. And then continuing northeast, we see a ray of sunshine illuminating a corpse lying next to another toxic barrel. In the skeleton's hand, we find a note, dying message. If you find this, my name is James Rubinek. I'm a trader from the hub. Thought I'd found a new route to Markets East. Guess now I know why no routes go through this godforsaken place. Legs broken, can't get out. And even if I could, there's those crazed ghouls and those digging things waiting for me. Please, get this note to my ex-wife, Anna. Tell her what happened. Tell her how I died. And I guess you can tell that cheating woman I hope she's happy with that limp Richard Rory Spencer. Yikes. That's a lot of hate to have. In his dying moments, the last thing on his mind was his hatred for his ex-wife. What a way to go. Next to his body, we find an adventurer's pack. And inside, ammo, chems, and some ammunition crafting supplies. There's also a marksman carbine here, but I've collected quite a few of those already, so I'm going to leave it. Backing out, we can loot some 556 cases on the ground. But moving forward, we hear tunnelers. Oh, God. Whoa! I love this riot shotgun. Part of me wishes I'd made a shotgun surgeon build. Maybe I'll have to make a new character. This shotgun is awesome. But I'm specced into cowboy, so switching to my revolver, we can try to take out the tunnelers in the adjacent room. That 
just not as effective as I had hoped, so switching back to the riot shotgun... Oh my, this is my new favorite thing. When the tunnelers are dead, we can move south and exit the cave. With the northeast explored, we can move southwest. Here we find a sunken building, and we can enter it through one of its blasted out windows. Behind a bookshelf, we find a duffel bag, and in the shelf, we find a metal box. And finally to the south, we find another duffel bag lodged between some rock rubble. But that's where this floor ends. Moving out, I saw some movement on the roof of the building that we came from. Switching to my sniper rifle. Yeah, something's moving, but he moved just beyond sight. So I'm going to climb up this window ledge to improve my vantage point. There we go. Got him. Oh, that was Blade. I just killed Blade. Okay. Well, at least I don't have to worry about him anymore. Let's hope I can find his body. Heading back down to the ground, we can move south. In the southwestern corner between a building and a rock wall, we can loot a filing cabinet. And then turning northeast back around the building, we can disarm some satchel charges on the ground and then turn west through a broken window into the building. We can turn right past a kitchen, then turn left into a wrecked bedroom. Here we can loot a number of containers, including a first aid box and an ammunition canister. And on the wall above the ammo canister is another Ralphie poster. And upon activating the poster, we trigger more marked men to spawn. but the riot shotgun saves the day. Man, I think I'm in love. Turning back around to finish exploring, we see a workbench here next to a metal box. This is a great opportunity, if our unarmed skill is high enough, to craft the Fist of the North Rar, or Fist of the Rar. Turning around and backing out of this building, it's about time to take care of some of these nuclear warheads. So moving a safe distance away, we can pull out our laser detonator to do the job. Detonating this one sadly doesn't reveal anything. Just a bunch of concrete and fire. Hopping up on some concrete and moving to the northeast, we pass by the ruins of a campsite. Here we can loot a metal box, a duffel bag with 100 caps inside, and a footlocker by a barrel fire. From here, we can move north, but we got to be careful of these satchel charges. And then up the side of this ruined sinking building. This is that same building that we were inside of where we found that still functional terminal. It's also the building that Blade was walking on when we shot and killed him. I looked all over for his corpse, but I couldn't find it up here. After much searching, I finally found it back down on the ground. On his body, we find another Blade of the West and the unique Marked Beast Eyes Helmet. This is the last of the unique hand-wrought Legion-inspired helmets and masks from the Lonesome Road DLC. This one is different from all of them in that the helmet only has a partial mask. It has an eye guard covering the bridge of the nose and the eyes, but it leaves the mouth and chin exposed. Strangely enough, even though it does have the eye mask, you can wear glasses and other eyewear with it. It grants a DT of 3, plus 3 to melee weapons, and plus 10 to hit points. You can repair it with combat helmets. Back on the side of the sunken building, we can bypass the broken windows that would just drop us down back inside of it and move south to a rocky platform. Here we can lose even more limbs. <laughs> Gotta love it! And we find the wastewater treatment plant. If you recall from yesterday's video, these were the guys whose frequent requests for money so annoyed the base treasurer. 
we see another nuclear warhead to the east, and a big pipe in front of us, but before going that way, we see a path leading off to the southwest. This path creeps along a rocky ledge, and brings us to a ramp passing through a broken window of a ruined building lodged into the rock. Here we find two ammo canisters near to a window overlooking the rooftop of the building where we found the last Ralphie poster. From here, we can pull out our laser detonator and get rid of a nuclear warhead clinging from the rocks to the west. To go and explore the detonation site, we turn around, go back down the ramp, and then hop onto the ground to the west. Taking some rubble down to this rooftop, we find another pool. At the bottom of the pool, we find an ammunition box. And beneath some rubble, behind the pool, we find a survivor's footlocker, filled with a huge store of ammunition, armor, and chems. We can move to the southwest corner of the building to try and explore that detonation site, but here all we see is a big pile of ruined pre-war signs. These don't lead anywhere. But, moving to the northwest corner of this building, we see another warhead clinging to the canyon wall that we can go ahead and detonate. When done, we can retrace our steps all the way back to the water treatment plant. We can go ahead and detonate the warhead sitting next to a big yellow truck. And upon detonating it, we find two lead-lined metal boxes, and we see that the yellow truck now acts as a ramp leading down to the earth on the other side of that ruined building. We see Ulysses' red warning graffiti on some scrap metal, and when we're ready, we can enter the sewer grate to the wastewater treatment plant. Heading down a tube, we find an ammunition box next to a still-glowing lantern. Turning east leads to a doorway, and on the other side we find a room filled with water and tunnelers. Pulling out a flashbang. It didn't seem to do much this time. The tunnelers are being overwhelmed by a bunch of marked men. We can start picking off the marked men to even out the odds. After looting the corpses, we can walk up some stairs to the north. Turning left, we find a few containers. In the desk, we find a copy of Fixin' Things. And on the desk, we can read the manager's terminal. Here we find two notes. The first is email to the city treasurer. Commander Devlin, I apologize for emailing you again, but I still haven't received a response to my previous seven emails. Once again, we desperately need more funding to improve safety protocols at the water treatment plant. Current protocols are absolutely appalling, and I don't even want to think about the consequences of a failure on the local water supply. Specialist Alan Rothschild. I can only imagine we found a waste disposal plant right next to the water treatment plant, storing so many barrels of toxic waste right next to the plant used to treat the water they drank, probably contaminated the water table. Couldn't have been healthy for this community. And in the final note, we find a reply from the city treasurer. Listen here, you pinko commie-eyed puke. I got your lily-livered defeatist emails. I ignored them because they made me throw up in my mouth. Do you understand we're fighting a war here against the Reds? And the only thing standing between you and hot atomic Armageddon is me and my base full of giant nuclear missiles. Answer me this, Specialist Batinsky. If the American people are overrun by Kremlin Joe and his chai cronies, what good will clean drinking water be? Commander Devlin. Goodness, this guy is such a charmer. I wouldn't want to have a beer with him. And is anyone else disturbed that the base commander is also the treasurer? Usually those are different jobs, right? With the two being one and the same, I think there may be a conflict of interest there. And upon reading this terminal, if we've read all others and collected all other notes, we complete the challenge Nostalgia, having found all ten journal entries in the Divide. We can loot the few containers in this room. We find a wooden box filled with apples, strangely enough. And against the northern wall, we find the next Ralphie poster. On the floor behind an overturned table, we find two boxes of 10mm rounds and an ammunition box. 
and on the other side of a toilet stall to the northeast, we find four lockers. Sadly, no riot gear, but a few small chems. When done, we can head down the stairs to the flooded treatment room, and then back through the cave and out the tunnel. Well, from here, we've got one path forward, and that's to scale the side of this ruined building to the north. Off in the distance, we see another nuclear warhead hanging out on the side of this ravine. We can go ahead and detonate it. And at the end of the building, we see a billboard leading down to a ruin below. Instead of sliding down that, I'm gonna move over to the west here. We see a ramp made from scrap metal leading through a window into the neighboring building. If we climb down some scrap wood ramps to the bottom level, we find a duffel bag wedged in here, but that's it. So climbing back up, we find a rubble ramp that leads down to a rocky ledge overlooking the fishbowl. Here we can take that scrap metal ramp that crossed the small ravine leading to the waste disposal plant to find a ledge leading to the broken window of a nearby building. But this rubble is lined with more satchel charges. We see Ulysses' red mark, so we need to be careful. Crouching down, we see a number of bookshelves to either side, and moving southeast to the window, up. The gig is up. With that, we clear all of the marked men in this fishbowl. We find ourselves in a messy camp, strewn with garbage, containers, and more of those marked men hovels. And while we loot, we discover the door to Ulysses' temple. So this is where Ulysses is hiding, where Ulysses brought Eddie. We will open the doors to Ulysses' temple, and finally, at long last, confront the man in our next episode. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the Fallout games, but I've dedicated all this week, and I will be dedicating much of next week, to the Lonesome Road DLC for Fallout New Vegas. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have an episode for you tomorrow. But never fear, I will be back Tuesday morning with Episode 7, Our Confrontation with Ulysses. If you want to make sure that you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop, folks. Who are you that do not know your history? That's right, I've got a double-sided shirt. On one side, we have Ulysses' famous quote, and on the back, we've got his old world flag symbol. I also have versions of this shirt with just the quote on the front and just the image on the back. These shirts come in a wide array of colors and in a variety of sizes. I have a bunch of other designs on a bunch of other products. So if you want to check out my shop, you can find a link in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you Tuesday morning, bright and early, with Episode 7.